يا شكرا جزيلا الان خلونا ننتقل الى الجلسه الاخيره وبعدها بعد الجلسه ان شاء الله راح ننتقل الى حفل الجوائز هذه الجلسه راح تستضيف رواد في تكنولوجيا المصرفيه والماليه راح يدير هذه الجلسه ريتا مخول مديره التحرير بعرب نت حيكون عنوان هذه الجلسه عن التكنولوجيا الماليه في الاسواق الناميه نرحب معي باستاذ ريتا Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before I call in our panelists, um, can we just, there's a video we're going to be playing first. Thank you. Can I call up, I'm a panelist, Nancy Basuni, Vice President at the uh, Head of Digital Innovation Department at Barclays Egypt. We have joining us as well today, um, Amberin Musa, who's CEO at Sukhil Mal, and Kevanch Onan, Regional Director of PayPal and Mina. So, so considering the, sorry, hello, okay, considering that global funding to funding as estimated or according to the CBE Insights and KPMG's Pulse of FinTech report, it's reached uh, $2.4 billion in the third quarter of 2016, that's global funding to FinTech companies. Um, Jamalto estimates that mobile banking users is going to exceed 80 million users in the MENA in 2017. And according to this research we just saw, the video we just saw, uh, conducted by ArabNet, 75% of Saudis are users of digital and mobile banking. So looking at all these aspects, I wanted to first discuss on 
um, how crucial is the role of fintech in emerging markets? Uh, and I'd like to hear all three of your thoughts on the matter. Would you like to start with, with that, Yvonne? Yes. Um, um, I mean, if you look at the numbers in, at large at emerging markets, um, there are different types of uh, trends that drive uh, wild fintech companies or fintech innovation. Uh, we should not necessarily only split fintechs versus banks. It's about the fintech innovation, how technology plays a role in solving the consumer and the market problems. So we see from, if you look at from that angle, definitely uh, you see uh, a quite uh, prominent um, a mechanism in which uh, the consumer problems or market problems, merchant problems, can be solved via fintech. Um, in the large, um, I mean, even around the globe, right, if you look at it just from a payments perspective as well, uh, still about 85% of total spending is in cash. So if you look at it, um, the, the difficulties in terms of cash transactions, not only in e-commerce but everywhere, everywhere else, you see a lot of need and latent demand in terms of solving the, uh, the consumer problems from that angle. So FinTech definitely has an opportunity in that, in that space, both addressing current consumer needs, uh, and, but as, as much so, and, as, and more strongly even, uh, the underbanked of uh, the ones that have not been necessarily included in the, in the financial services sector today. Um. Tom Berry? Um, yeah, I think I, it's, you almost said everything I wanted to say, but uh, I think there is not just the banks, it's, it's all the services such as remittances and, and especially the underbank, I agree. I think there's a huge opportunity for, for uh, fintech companies, but I can just take a step back. I think talking about fintech evolution here in, in the emerging countries versus developed countries is very, very different. I think we're still quite far away um, from where the rest of the world is, and when we talk about fintech, a lot of the fintech companies that we see bringing, getting brought up or starting up in, in the Middle East is actually a lot of Me Too's. It's a lot of copycats uh, taking ourselves, for example, Sukalmal is a copycat of money supermarket and lending tree out of the US. And the reason is because we haven't even gone there yet. This is the basics we're even trying to fulfill. So it's not just a matter of is it important because we need it, but it's important because the basics haven't been completed. There's, I mean, the region has grown immensely in the last 30, 40 years. And there's a lot of loopholes and gaps that hasn't been filled, and which is why I guess a lot of us as entrepreneurs were here to fill that gap. Nancy, I want the same answer, like, well, answer the same question from you. But I also want it in particular because right now, Barclays Egypt were the first uh, bank to launch its own accelerator, fintech accelerator as well. So if we can. Um, Combine those, like give me an idea of why that was also done. Actually, I kind of agree with you that we're still at the very early stage from uh, setting the tone just like the rest of the world. However, I think we've, we've, we're, we're just starting. We've recently launched our FinTech Accelerator and the demo day was just last week. And the quality of applicants we, th we thought that we're getting, we actually expected way less than what we got. Some of them were not really relevant, but I would say 65% of the applicants presented were actually fintech related. So we're there somehow, but it needed a lot of effort from us to start educating the market about what fintech is all about. So the reason that we were able to succeed with that level of applicants was the, the, the several road shows that we've done prior to the launch of the, or opening of the applications, because we've been everywhere. We've went to universities, we've went to big events, we started educating the market what fintech is all about. What do banks expect when we say fintech? We brought together people from technology, people from digital marketing that have nothing to do with banks because banks are not, the banking population are not the ones who will drive the fintech. We need people coming from fresh minds, people who understand technology, people who understand digital, and they understand the bank pain areas and then put them together. So I would say we're, we're almost there. I mean, maybe we're not as advanced as the, the, the global world is, but we're, we're putting our steps in the right direction. I'm glad you mentioned education because um, a question I have for you is what do you think the fintech ecosystem or is lacking in infrastructure as a whole in the region, whether it's in terms of education, regulatory uh, um, awareness, is it funding, is it all of the above, and 
what could be done to enhance this as well? If we look at FinTech, then we need to look at what are the factors that are actually enable or disable the, the driving FinTech. And I would say this is the, the, the culture of the organization itself, the skills of the people in it. So people internally as one club, and then the customer readiness, then the infrastructure, then the regulatory authorities and the compliance. And from a regulatory authority and compliance, I think it's just, it's kind of, they're all picking up across the MENA region in general. All regulatory authorities realize the importance of starting to pick up. Some are faster than others, but at least the mindset is there. So maybe they're operating at a slower pace than what we expect them to, but they're picking up. The most important aspect, I think, is the, is the organizational culture. And this is the thing where focus needs to be done because innovation shouldn't lie in the hands of technology or digital. It has to be a one-centric team driving innovation and cuts across all the products and services that the organization offers. If it's given within the hands of digital, then they view it from a from a ease of implementation perspective, not knowing what kind of business impact they're missing. So it has to come from the business beneficiary. They have to drive it. Amarim, do you agree on the same points on the infrastructure, what's lacking? I mean, from your point of view, uh, Nancy is talking from a bam banking perspective, possibly on FinTech. As a FinTech yourself, what do you think currently is lacking in the ecosystem? Um, I think, I think taking a step back for a minute, there's been a lot of discussions around is it fintech or is it the banks and who's going to win the game and I think it's not at all. Um, I think it's more which bank will win the game in a certain way. It, it's about who jumps at the bandwagon first, who actually innovate, who, who, and I think you guys have done a fantastic job is to open up and embrace the new fintech companies actually starting. And I think particularly fintech companies are faced with the fact that they're not here to replace the bank. Some of them are you know, new lending, peer-to-peer -peer lending, uh, crowdfunding, that type of thing is, but they will never be able to actually completely replace the banks. We're not here for that. But if you think about the ecosystem, it's a huge puzzle. And a lot of us are filling one of those pieces and one of those pieces of the puzzle. For example, well, what we do is we, we, we fill the puzzle of, of acquisition, for example. We allow the banks to pick and choose the right customer at the right time and the one who's actually looking for their product based on the eligibility criteria that they want. Um, but post that, we don't go any further than that. You've got another company who will come in and help the, the credit scoring system. Um, so so it, the ecosystem itself has got lots of puzzles and it's more of a complementary. Uh, all the fintech companies and banks should be working together. And I think the reason you've had so many applicants, Nancy, is a lot of us depend on you to survive in a certain way because it is a whole ecosystem together. But I think at the same time, it's still a very educational time for all of us from regulators to, and I've spoken to both regulators here and, and the UAE, it, we're still learning, it, it's still new for us. And all the stakeholders around the business, around the, the ecosystem, which are the banks, ourselves, the regulators, there are people we talked about earlier who don't even know they're a fintech company. So it's a whole lot of education that's happening at the moment, but we're learning and we will learn as we grow as, as an ecosystem altogether. Um, are there improvements to be made? Absolutely. There are improvements in regulations, there are improvements in, in, in even the banks opening up and embracing that. Uh, the new fintech companies come on board and, and I love what I'm hearing. It, it's, it's really about who gets out there first. Um, we were recently in, and that's a, that's a story, we were recently in, I was speaking at one of the insurance panels back in the UAE and the discussion, it was a broker panel and we've just launched our car insurance aggregator in the UAE which in sense could potentially replace a broker. And the whole discussion was around, you're a threat to us. You're coming out here and you're gonna replace brokers uh, and you know, the regulators should be regulating you. Um, and no one in that room actually got up and said, wait a minute, what about the consumer? Has anybody thought that the demand for an online car insurance aggregator to buy their car insurance and get it through within 15 minutes is, is what the consumer is demanding? And so the flip side of it was as brokers, instead of you know, thinking about the traditional business you've been on for the last 30 years, the ones who are gonna succeed is gonna be the one who jumps and adapts to the new consumer trends. Um, yeah, I mean, I like that a lot because innovations kind of has to be driven by the consumer needs. And most often than not, the consumer itself may not necessarily realize what that needs are. There is often that element and I have worked in, in banks and you know, advised banks for a long time. My pre 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 previous career, 
there's always a notion of how do you create innovation. And sometimes people go direct to consumer, held focus groups, um, and try to bring that insight into the innovation itself. Sometimes you have to call what the consumer hasn't yet discovered or said so. And that's the element, I guess, when you compare startups versus uh, large institutions, startups have an advantage because they can act, act much more uh, rapidly um, on certain needs they see and the risks for them is, is lower compared to a larger institution. And PayPal itself is the, I guess, the true fintech company, right? It's the first one, I guess, the first ever fintech company reaching a billion dollar valuation back in 2002. So that's also the element of uh, how you, um, uh, an example that we could look into, how you build a need, answer that need, but how do you leverage and scale it with true partnerships? PayPal itself is about 15,000 banks partnering around the world. We uh, partner with 52 or so uh, schemes, card schemes around the world. So it's, it's how we actually reached our scale is through, uh, through true partnerships that could, you know, get basis on win-win, but also helps us to capture a certain need and answer that need. Today there's about 90, 192 million customers uses PayPal and 2015 numbers was about $282 billion worth of transactions globally across 202 markets. So the scale you will need to gain as a fintech, uh, at some point you have to come to a, a I guess realization how you partner with the existing players. With the existing players, how you can leverage the innovation, this, the, the ability of a smaller startups and benefit for your own consumers, for your own customers and uh, fulfill a need and compete much more strongly in the space. That's correct. There are several like macro factors that have been driving fintech's growth at the end of the day. Um, I mean, um, technology definitely is one of them. Uh, the regulatory envir environment, if fav uh, favorable, of course, helps. And one of the essentials, I guess, is the demographics, is the large number of millennials that you have right now who are looking for convenience. They're looking for the digital technology, um, seamless kind of, um, they want their lives easier. They want everything to be more convenient and something, everything that's less time consuming. So if we take a step back and do look at the consumers, what do you think are the upcoming trends in the banking and finance sector um, that will shape the consumer's journey when it comes? Who would like to take this? I would actually like to comment on that because earlier in, uh, in my presentation I was sharing the same line of thought because in our uh, population, for example, we have 40% of our population is already between the age of 25 to 35. So this, these, are, these are the kind of people that we are calling them the millennials and they have completely different way of doing things. They want it now, they want an element of convenience, they want customization. The concept of one size fits all that more, more, most banks have been doing doesn't, fit, doesn't suit them. They want, uh, we need to capitalize on the power of the network because if you bring one customer, you're bringing many following him because the way they take their decision is based on referrals of recommendations from the friend. And this is extremely powerful from a banking perspective. You sell to one customer, you bring his entire network. Okay. That's, uh, you wanted to comment on this, Jamal? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I guess the, 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 the consumer, I mean, there's demographics play to it. Uh, but I also believe the technology plays a big, a big play to it. So despite having a young population in this region is what drives a lot of the innovation and it's, it's also seen in our, in our numbers. We recently launched, uh, announced a research uh, that, it, that looked to MENA specifically across the global commerce as well as uh, around 32 countries. And, um, and this region has the highest uh, mobile penetration in global shopping uh, if compared to, uh, to web. And, Rating globally is about 55% still through laptops and, 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 uh, and, and computers. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's about 65% or so for mobile from this region. So it's the, 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 the gap is also has been in favor of this region in, in, this, in, in this particular um, aspect. So it's definitely I see the, the mobile technologies driving that, uh, particularly it's much more uh, speed. Um, uh, and the, the, the screen itself doesn't allow for a lot of complexity, which otherwise would, you could build that complexity in a branch or web or ATM. 
the mobile itself, you don't build a complexity, therefore it has to be simple. So there's element of the demographics, there's element of technology enablement that drives that um, trans as well. But I don't particularly see the millennials are not necessarily only reason per se for the innovation. Uh, I think there's also demand coming from as technology becomes available, also demand from uh, middle age and above as well is also coming, yeah. How about in terms of security? When it comes to financials, everybody's like always worried, like banks are worried in, in terms of security, the end users are worried about security. Um, we see in the region, uh, majority prefer crash, cash over credit card. Um, how does that play a role? Like especially with PayPal looking at the e-commerce market, for instance. Um, what's your input on that? I mean, security is what we work on, what we build our entire value proposition on. PayPal itself doesn't share the financial information, so that brings the added security for a consumer not to give their uh, card information or banking information to the merchant if they shop around. But we also uh, offer a buyer protection in which if the goods doesn't arrive, if, if it's not as significantly described, PayPal comes in and refunds the, uh, the purchase, etc. We, we build a lot of value proposition uh, around um, uh, security and safety and getting people uh, used to uh, shopping online in particular. That's where, where we come in. So security is always going to be there. The, the, the level of security goal uh, has also uh, changed uh, over time. And so there's a lot of education around that that needs to come into the picture. Today, if you look at the, the, the MENA region at large, still even on e-commerce, 80% or so of the numbers I, I get is cash on delivery. The people still feel a bit, I guess, nervous about using their card, nervous about using their um, uh, financial uh, means. Uh, some of it may be cultural, some of it because the offering in the market is not as diverse as the address or is not as local as it di uh, as addresses. So there's element of supply and demand in that, in that space as well, not only for the consumer, but also what's, what's on offer. If I may add to that, I think, not to disagree with what you said, but the, <laughs> the, the high level of cash on, de on delivery, I think sometimes we need to kind of take a step back and think, is it really just about security of the credit card? Um, I think part of it, yes, part of it is. I think part of it also is the trust into the operations of the actual company you're buying it from. Is the, is the goods gonna turn up? Are the goods gonna turn up? Um, are they gonna be in good condition? Or, and if I don't like it, can I just return it without the hassle of get a, getting a, a refund on it? I actually believe with you very much because recently in, uh, <laughs> in an e-commerce application in, in the local market, they've invented the concept of card on delivery. So now you guarantee that you're actually getting your product. And Are you willing to pay in, uh, in your credit card? And it was amazing the level of adoption. I, so I, 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 I kind of agree. <laughs> Nancy, what is, you mentioned earlier something about organizational culture. So. What has been the biggest challenges for banks in driving innovation and in moving to more of a digital bank? Especially in terms of like the internal culture shift, uh, maybe it's on adopting new technologies. Can you share your insights on those? First, let's step one step back. I am kind of disagreeing on the concept of calling it a digital bank, okay? so. The way I see it is digital is a way of doing business. It's not limited to the digital banking experience. It goes to the much easier banking, the value added services. How are you going to capitalize on the digital to do the sales? And then eventually, how are you going to innovate partnering through third parties? So it's way beyond the digital banking per se. And if an organization wants to head that path, they have to make sure that it's the voice from the top that's actually calling for that. So the commitment has to start from the top management feeding into each and every single business division. If the commitment is not there from the top management and their willingness to accept failure, it's not going to happen because the, the, the bottom up approach doesn't work because by the end of the day, everybody is sitting on a business territory that they worry about their P&L very much. And if you go to the retail director, for example, tell him we'll do X, Y, and Z, and this is uh, good. He's too focused on his STP. So unless long term the banks plan for like five years from now, this is where we want to become, it's not going to happen. So unless it's top down, it's not going to happen. And do you think that customers are more ready to uh, 
changed in the bank? Like, uh, to customer to readiness is not debatable across <laughs> the globe, across the MENA region, across Saudi, across Egypt. We all are positive that customer readiness is, is unquestionable. It's are we fast enough to meet their expectations or not? So I don't think that any of us is questioning, questioning the customer readiness. No, we did a survey not long ago, actually, and figured out that 95% of our customer base wanted to renew their car insurance online and did not want to talk to anybody on the phone through their credit card. So it, cool. it tells you the customer is definitely ready. It's about whether we are, are ready we? to adapt. <laughs> and what do you think is needed from us to help advance the fintech industry in the region? So, so here's an example. So until today, in again, I'm, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the UAE, uh, we, as a bank, you can't actually give an approval online. I worked in the UK between 2004 and 2007 and I launched the first ever online bank in a certain way where we, we set up everything from application of a credit card all the way to signature of contract online. The approval gets done in 30 seconds, signature of contract and card was in the customer's hand within seven days. And that, even that was, we were the first one to do it back in the UK. That was ran quite a while ago. Um, the, the law, the regulation tells you in the, UK, in, in the UAE that you need a pen on paper signature to do a credit scoring, a credit check on a, on a customer, and to even have an application. So that kills the whole online banking industry, right? But it's getting there. I mean, the, you know, the regulatory uh, measures are being taken. They're thinking about it. It's like, how do, we, how do we move forward, but also protect as well the ecosystem and not just open up um, suddenly, so, so there is, but there is the, the, the knowledge and the education is happening, but it's still slow. It's, it's, it's still not there yet. And so what that means for a fintech company like mine, I actually can't even do a credit check. So I can't actually fulfill what I would love to do and make that process from application to credit check to closure of the loan as efficient as it could have been in a certain way. So you've got the regulatory aspect of things. You've got um, the education aspect of into to the bank and the readiness. I mean, the legacy systems of the banks are very, very old and you know, even API connections to the banks is, is still an issue. It's getting there, but it's still an issue. I would say it's getting there because I'm aware that ourselves as Barclays, we've been pioneers in the innovation uh, domain and we've been enabling the open APIs for a while now. So I think that we're, we're, we started earlier, especially in the UK and other parts of the world. I think we also talk about, this it touches upon I mean, in, in the global trends, there's also the discussion around regulatory tech, reg tech, they also refer to it. All other enablers, if you look at the larger fintech companies that came to the place, they tend to be from the markets where the financial technology has been built on some of the standardized systems and the startups can have access to it. In emerging markets at large, these, these sectors have not been necessarily evolved so fast. MENA region is an exception, or GCC in particular is an exception. There's a lot of progress on that front from IDs, from you know, the uh, uh, online verification of uh, individuals and so forth, Emirates ID, Shubu, uh, these are things that, like that. But the regulation tech aspect of it is also one of the enabler, as there are more resources and investment going into place, either by the uh, governments themselves or the actual startups. Uh, uh, solving those kind of problems for the banks, for the fintechs, and providing access and, and making those processes easier, that will also Im Im uh, improve on that front. Okay. Um, Amber, you mentioned the ecosystem. We were talking about the ecosystem earlier on how the, there's a need for them to collaborate together, to create that more holistic kind of ecosystem where everybody supports everybody. The banks, the, the fintech players, all the fintech players together, like what is needed for them to all unify and work together? Like you said it, they're all scattered all over the place. What do you think is needed right now to get them all together working collaboratively? Honestly, I think it's education. I mean, you would agree with me, you're from, a, you're from a bank, but at the end of the day, the bank is kind of in the core of it all and we're all trying to work uh, with the different banks trying to make little bits and pieces around it and different services that they are trying to achieve better, more efficient, uh, more transparent. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's honestly, I think it's, it's two things. It's regulatory aspect of things, which is normal in every industry in that, in that matter of fact. But um, I think education is really where it all boils down to in terms of, you know, the banks thinking, is this good for me or is this going to cause problems more than anything else? Am I ready? actually uh, embrace this particular fintech of, or 
And a lot of banks would tell you, no, I'm not. I, I have a million other priorities right now to deal with versus what you can bring. And, and a lot of companies here in the region, especially, are still small. So and a, there's, there's a culture of, of, you know, unless you become big and important, I wouldn't be looking at you. You're still small. So we, we don't worry about you until you become a problem in a certain way. Um, but I think that's where the education of, of all the stakeholders, for that matter, and it's not a competition, it's more of a trying to bring the ecosystem together. So we've mentioned education of regulators, regulation of all the stakeholders. You've just worked with a lot of fintech starters, like uh, startups, I'm sorry. Um, what do you think of them as well? I think I would like to add just one point to that. I think we would like to have more of Ar similar or the likes of ArabNet events. Because basically what you need to bring them together under one umbrella in an informal networking uh, session where everybody showcase their best practices and it's like no pressure whatsoever. Those who are actually interested to know more are the ones who will show, show up to, to these events and this is the perfect place where people can share ideas without feeling any kind of threat from the opponent. So I would be here, listen to somehow a fintech company proposing a new idea. They would be here trying to reach out for us as well. So the more we re share success stories, the more we're open to all lessons learned. And the more we know the lessons learned, the, the, the faster we'll be able to progress. So we need to share more, speak about it more, share case studies and learn from each other. So more Arabnet events. Mm, yeah, some more <laughs> Arabnet. <laughs> I think also market forces will drive that, right? I mean, it's already driving, right? There's already a lot of, a few years back, of course, you will remember, there won't be that many cooperation, even partnerships, three, four years, five years ago, not only in Egypt, but nowhere else, there was a uh, fintech incubators from the fin financial sector, uh, banks, etc. So it's the market forces also drive that. As more examples of that uh, become successful, there will be more joiners to, to collaborate both ends of the trade. In the beginning as well, the, some of the fintech companies, they do think they're fighting um, the banks or they're competing the banks in that, in that space. But at some point, they also hit a certain pla uh, plateau on their scale, which drives a further cooperation to build from that scale. So there's also market forces that are in play. It's inevitable. They will all, uh, at some point, uh, they don't necessarily have to be all friendly. Not all the banks are friendly. Not all the fintechs will be friendly. In, in, in the same sense, but the market forces will drive the good ones that who remain will the ones who cooperate and partner more than the ones that aren't. Back to my question to you on the 1864 accelerator. When you guys were working on that, um, it was a long process, you said. Um, I'm sure it was quite difficult, it was quite challenging. First time this was done in the region by a bank. Um, in collaboration with Flat Six Labs, if I'm not mistaken. First of all, why Flat Six Labs? Actually, we're very careful about selecting the partner to partner with on that because we've heard about so many accelerators that are non-fintech, but usually the people who run the program, they go uh, based on an award thing or a grant thing or a scholarship thing. So you partner in a program or you are accepted in a certain cycle and then the winners would end up getting an award and that's it, end of story. What happens is the startup dies after a few months from the conclusion of the program. But with Flasex Labs, we were very much uh, curious or, or, or interested in the fact that they, they go a pri to a private equity model. So they put percentage in terms of seed funding so they're there to stay. They want to make sure that whatever business is that's happening, it's here to stay. There is a sustainable business model behind it. And they actually handhold the startups for the second round of investment. So that was the reason it was very, very important for us that we do not do a fintech accelerator where startups end up dying in a few months post the cycle. Were there any of those startups that um, I heard you talking earlier and you mentioned a few startups? that were quite interesting. Um, could you share it with us in this forum as well? Some sure. of the startups that took place at the Accelerator? Yeah, there, there actually, the, there were a couple of uh, applications submitted. We had more than 190 applications. After the bootcamp and the roadshows and the screening and blah, 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 we ended up with uh, eight uh, startups that were going to actually start uh, working with them, implement their ideas. Some of them are talking to retail. Some of them are talking to uh, SMEs. And I would use uh, two examples on top of my mind now, we had a startup called Money Fellows, and this is basically digitizing the experience of the Roscoe, which is the rotating of, 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 of the cash, 
in Arabic we call it الجماعية which is a concept of uh, kind of takaful which is uh, it also is Sharia compliant loan so people participate together in, in that Gamaya, which is like 10 people participate together in a cross circle and then every month someone pays a certain amount of money and then the beneficiary collects all the amounts so that was a good thing from uh, it's something that's happening in the Arab world across the Arab world it's a common practice people do it all the time except that there was always limitation to uh, bringing more scale due to geography or due to because we have to uh, actually do a physical errand to collect the cash from one entity to another there was limitation on the maximum amounts collected because usually run it with family or friends so the idea of digitizing the whole experience the way we see it is it will be a breakthrough because it it depends on the packaging for, for example I said if a taxi driver had an accident and he needs to raise an immediate amount of cash in order to fix his taxi and he doesn't have access to that and in some cases he might not be a bankable person so the, the money fellows or the gamaya, the digitized version of it, might actually be a good solution to do it. Another example was uh, Card Switch, which is a mobile application that gives the customer full control over his credit card. So you control what kind of uh, merchant category that you, you're okay to use their card. And it's as easy as setting the card on off, just like the menu on the, on the mobiles. You, you just control the spend, whether on foreign currency, on merchant category, on country, on online transaction. You can close your card from online transaction and then when you want to do it, you just enable it and close it again after you've done. So these are just two examples of things that can be kept in the customer's hand to control. Okay. Let's, I want to end this on a more positive note sort of thing. Um, as a forecast for the next couple of years, um, I expect to see a lot more banks hopefully embracing fintech. What kind of trends in particular to fintech, do we should we be expecting, especially from customer consumers? What are we? Sh what What is it that you think is going to change? How's the industry going to be shaping in the future? I think there will be more focus on the value-added services at the expense of the typical digital w way of doing things. So it will not be limited to anywhere, anytime banking, which is a much easier banking experience. Innovation will have to go beyond that. That we'll be seeing more of value-added services that are totally out of the scope of the banking industry, but banks have to partner with these third-party providers if they want to be competitive and if they want to offer something that the, 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 to sustain their business. So it will not be the financial proposition anymore, nor the digital uh, payments uh, only. I'm very um. I think come back to the point I made earlier on, I think it will be very much surrounded around customer service and okay. very much around the customer service angle, uh, very much around, because at the end of the day, it's the consumers driving it. Um, and I think a lot of the fintech innovations will be, again, uh, personally in the region, it will be a lot of me too's. There'll be a lot of things that's happened outside in the developed world coming back, coming into to the region as, as and when we are ready. Um, but I think you'll also get a lot of Uber-like applications where you know, you, you, you're stuck on, one of the main roads, uh, either through an accident or, or, or a flat tire, and here's your Uber application, get me an Uber or Kareem, get me up, and here is an application that goes straight to the roadside assistance um, truck. You see it kind of coming through, that's for the insurance industry anyway. Um, you can think coming through, you know exactly when it's gonna come and pick up your car. Claim goes straight to the claim, claim company. So there's a lot of those kind of innovations I think that will come through in the next two to three years. And I think the next two to three years, Honestly, in this part of the world, will change. Will have a drastic change, I think, because the, regulator, the regulators are moving. They, they are out here looking for how do we enable the fintech industry to grow. And I think the next 24 to 36 months will have a big change. I think just adding, both agreeing with both comments, but also adding to it, I see the big wave of uh, underranked population joining into the financial services is what we'll see the most. Previously, all those. Um, uh, uh, segments were um, not necessarily an interest for large institutions, for the banks, and, and etc. And they were underserved for a variety of reasons. They weren't profitable, they weren't that interesting, etc., etc. Or the technology wasn't there to serve them. And I see that's a big wave as those more people come into um, uh, financial inclusion. Um, 
that will also um, help with the growth of digital services, with the digital uh, financial services that uh, will also yield economic growth, et cetera. So I see that's the next couple of years. That's probably one of the trends that will, uh, that will continue and we'll see the smaller startups uh, addressing those much more efficiently than the big ones. Um, I think I'm going to move it to the audience right now and see if there's any questions from the audience that we can take. Anybody? There we go. Assalamu alaikum. This is Hussam Yagi from Atheon from Al Hamrani Group. My uh, question or comment to Amberine I've listened to you several times in UAE, here, other places, and usually you make good comments about what kills the digital experience, like your comment about the required manual process at the end of a digital application. Uh, yeah, definitely that kills the uh, ex digital experience. Technically, there are easy solutions around that. We could, I'm sure like you're aware, we could uh, uh, do uh, on, uh, digital mobile onboarding solutions to guarantee to the government that when Hussam is signing, it is Hussam who's signing, not somebody else. So we could have proper solutions to address the concerns of the government. Though if the, those government people are not present in such platforms like this one, how could they be aware of such technical solutions to their concerns? Um, I think these kind of panels help a lot and I think we do have uh, generally, all the panels I go to, they're regulators um, attending. But I think, don't forget that it is a whole ecosystem thing. So people like myself, other fintech companies, banks, we're constantly talking. We're constantly um, telling them what's going on uh, on the grounds. We're constantly telling them you know, what could be changed, suggestions of what can happen. So I, I think they are very, very open. I think we, we're talking. But again, it doesn't happen overnight. It would be dangerous if it happened overnight. So we need to give it time because it's not just an impact on one part of the ecosystem. It impacts the whole ecosystem and they need to think through properly what the impact has been. Uh, but just to your point, this, I mean, from an ID perspective, I get it, but you also have the credit scoring system that cannot be digitized today, until today anyway. The law doesn't allow it. Any, any more questions? I guess not. <laughs> well, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. إذا بنهاية هذه الجلسة أتوقع كذا عرب نت الرياض 2016 كانت هذه آخر جلساته وانتهت جلساته لكن ما انتهت الفعالية أنا شخصيا انتهى وقتي معكم كنت معكم يومين بمعدل 9 ساعات يوميا يعني 18 ساعة في وجيهكم شكرا لأنكم تحملتوني لكن شكرا شكرا للأمانة هذه أول مرة أكون فيها إم سي أو أخصائي تواصل جماهير على المسرح وفرصة سعيدة أني تعرفت عليكم إذا كنت حبيتوا فعلا تقديمي سيرفي تحية قوية إذا حبيت تقديمي إذا لا تحية بشويش <تصفيق> شكرا شكرا أنا محمد عزام إم سي عرب نت ممثل مسرحي أصلا وتشرفت كثير أني أكون إم سي لعرب نت 2016 الرياض الآن راح أترككم أو أودعكم تماما من هذا الستيج وأسلم الستيج للأستاذ عمر كريستيدس مع حفل ختام عرب نت الرياض 2016 راح يكون الأستاذ عمر في إعلان الفائزين بمسابقة عرب نت الجوائز اللي كنا أعلنا عنها صوتوا صوتوا إن شاء الله فازوا اللي صوتت لهم يا رب فالآن راح يطلع الأستاذ عمر كريستيدس في حفل ختام زي ما قلنا وإعلان جوائز الفائزين في مسابقات عرب نت 2016 الرياض شكرا جزيلا لكم شكرا